Oh, I'm sorry. Am I disturbing you? Hello, and welcome. It's time for another fireside chat. This time the fire is being represented by the sun and the scorching air temperatures outside because it's mid-July. So I wanted to talk about cameras and camera lenses. I've been a photographer and videographer uh, for many years. I'm currently 39 years old and I first started doing this uh, when I was I think around 23, 24. And um, I feel like throughout that period of time, I've tried a lot of different things, I learned a lot of different things, and sort of gelled into some things that worked for me. And so I want to talk about that. Um, but also I've found uh, that my, my style has become more refined. I've become more focused in what I'm able to do. And I've also gone through a lot of different gear um, of, you know, with various levels of success. So I wanted to bring this up because up until this point, this YouTube channel has been pretty much entirely devoted to music, uh, the music that I make, uh, talking about the, the different gear and synthesizers that I use and the sequencers and making some tutorial content and that kind of thing. I will still be doing some of that and uh, it's, I just kind of do it as the fancy strikes me. Lately, this year, uh, 2024, I've been really kind of reignited my, uh, my interest in still photography and also videography where I'm exercising more control in the, the filmmaking process. Um, so basically I, I really enjoy hand holding a camera and operating it manually while I'm filming something. And when I film these types of videos, I can't do that because I have to be on camera, I have to be in front of it. And so I have to use cameras locked off on a tripod. So with my interest in doing more handheld camera operation, I've been working with uh, various other musicians uh, that I've met here through the Asheville synth community and working on recording some of their performances. So um, I'll still be recording some of my own, but I've also been doing a lot more collaborative kind of, you know, jams and hangouts with people too. And so my, my kind of music has shifted from being more, you know, purely a solo pursuit to being now more of a collaborative thing. And I think that's, that's all very positive. So the quantity of videos that I put out related to music is probably going to be going down a bit, um, but hopefully the quality will be going up as I'll be putting more time into each one and have more, uh, you know, more ability to be behind the camera and operating it in the ways that I want to. So to sort of earmark this kind of transition uh, in you know, the art that I'm creating and what I'm choosing to share, I wanted to make this video where I just share some of my thoughts about cameras and lenses, kind of what I've learned um, over the past 15 plus years of using them, and kind of how it, uh, what things have worked for me, what things haven't, that kind of thing. Now, I could probably talk about this stuff for like two hours straight, and I'm going to try to be more concise than that. So I'm going to punctuate this into these sort of eras of photography and video work uh, throughout you know, my, my history with it here. So I first started getting into this um, as part of a job. I was um, basically the webmaster for an organization and they wanted constant uh, you know, new stories put up with new photos. And so I got a budget to buy a camera and start shooting the photos that would go along with these stories. And so I got into it from sort of that like semi-journalistic angle. Um, I believe it was the Canon T1i was the camera uh, that I got with the kit lens, the 18 to 55 lens. And um, basically during that first year or two, I mostly just learned about composition and the exposure triangle. So the, the fundamental basics of photography is what I focused on. I didn't really do any video that first year. Once I left that job, I then for a period of time didn't have a camera, um, but I started dating someone who had a Nikon DSLR. I'm pretty sure it was the D3100, again with the Nikon kit lens shot on that one for about a year. And I did get some shots I'm very happy with from that camera, um, but I could never get over the, the, the focus and the zoom rings being backwards as compared to Canon. Since I learned Canon first, and that was kind of in my muscle memory, the Nikon always felt off to me. And so um, I never quite got on with it. That was also the first time I started experimenting with vintage lenses or old lenses. And because the one really cool thing about Nikon is up until recently, they had the same lens mount, the Nikon F mount, uh, for 
I think over 50 years. So you could put a very old lens on a modern digital camera and it would just click right on. Um, and so I remember I found some, some Photoshop that had, or some camera shop that had like their discount, uh, you know, case it was like every lens in this case is $10. So I think I bought three of those and they were all just these older kind of Nikon or like off brand, like Vivitar, um, zoom lenses. And none of them were very good. Um, in retrospect, it was more a skill issue than it was a camera issue because I just didn't really know what I was doing. Um, you know, I'm, I'm using like a long 300 millimeter lens on an entry level DSLR with no image stabilization, expecting good results with that, you know, handheld, you're just not going to get it. So, um, I got kind of a negative impression of vintage lenses from that era, but really that was more, I think my skill issue than it was those particular lenses or that particular camera. Um, so fast forward a bit through another job, I was given a, like a bonus, um, to, and you know, they kind of joked that it was a camera budget because they knew I was really into photography and wanted a camera. Um, I had been just shooting stuff on my phone mostly prior to that. And so I, um, I ended up buying the, I think it was what I was planning to do was to buy the Rebel T5i. But then when I w actually went to the store to buy one, there was one on sale, which is this one right here. So uh, this is the Canon SL1. At the time that I bought it, it would have been with the 18 to 55 kit lens. Uh, I no longer have that lens. Um, but this is, SL stands for super lightweight. So it's the super lightweight one. It's the, um, the smallest and lightest DSLR in the world at the time it was released. And you can see it's so small that I actually can't fit my pinky on there really. You have to kind of wrap your pinky around the bottom. So it has a different grip than most DSLRs. Um, but for any Canon user, it's gonna feel very, uh, very comfortable. And at home, it's the same menu system and a lot of the same controls and all that. So this camera, um, I actually, I went through two of them. The first one uh, was lost to the sea because the sea be a fickle mistress. I was shooting kind of a low down shot like this uh, of like waves coming up and this, this kind of sneaker wave came up from the side and just just splashed against the side of the camera and it was just completely done. Salt water will just destroy most electronics, cameras included, uh, even if it's weather sealed, which is not, but even if it's weather sealed, salt water is probably gonna kill your camera. So lost the first one to the sea, um, immediately went out and bought a second one because I love this body so much. I like didn't even try to shop around or research for something newer. I was just like, no, I, I know this one. I want the same one again. So grand total, I shot on this body for about seven years. And uh, I think the majority of my photography portfolio uh, was from this camera. I also shot a fair amount of video with it. At the time, I was mostly focused on making music videos, um, a lot of which I would make by just kind of shooting like ambient video around town, around a city, or time lapses. Um, I did a lot of time lapses of sunsets. And then I would use that footage to construct music videos. I did a few performance videos, you know, someone live playing guitar or singing or something like that. Not a whole lot. Um, in general, I found the, the still photography on this camera is awesome. Um, you know, there's certainly some like modern features I now use that this camera doesn't have. Uh, focus peaking being the number one thing. Um, now, given that it's an optical viewfinder, you know, there is no way of doing focus peaking there. You can actually add focus peaking to this camera through the Magic Lantern custom firmware. You load it on there and then you can turn on focus peaking. Of course, it only works through the rear screen, but you do have it as well as other things like zebras and stuff like that, histograms, you know. So this is really, it's a pretty basic camera, but um, especially with that Magic Lantern firmware added on, it can do a ton of stuff. So it really is very capable. In terms of image quality for stills, I have zero complaints. It's awesome for that. In terms of image quality for video, I do think that it's, it doesn't really hold up anymore. Um, it's you know 1080p, 30, 30 frames per second is the max it'll do. And it's, um, it looks okay, but it just, it always comes off a little bit soft, a little bit, just, there's not a ton of detail, especially if you have to crop into the video at all, it starts looking pretty bad. Um, low light capabilities, not amazing uh, for video. So 
ultimately I kind of outgrew this camera. A lot of the early videos I did, like the earlier tutorials and stuff I did on this channel, this is the camera I'd often use as the overhead one, so it's looking straight down. Um, and so there's still, you know, a fair bit of footage from this camera um, or in the earlier videos from this channel. I don't think I'll ever sell this one um, because I just have such a history, so much kind of nostalgia with it. Like I, I literally traveled the world with this thing. It's It's been to, I don't know, probably 20 different countries. And um, it's it's just been a very reliable camera and it's so small and lightweight. Um, it's just, it'll go places other cameras won't because, you know, it's, you, when it's small and lightweight, you want to carry it. it. It doesn't bother you to carry it around versus a big heavy camera. I've, in my experience, I will bring it out for a particular intentional shoot, but I won't just carry it casually around. So like this was my everyday carry for about seven years. Um, and I think that says a lot about a camera. So I still highly recommend the Canon SL1. If you're new to photography and a uh, video is kind of an afterthought for you um, and you just, you need to learn the basics, you're starting you know, from not knowing what you're doing. This is a really great camera to learn on. These days they go for about $100 used, which is I think an absolute bargain. And that's the other reason I'm not gonna sell it because it's not worth very much for me to sell it. Um, I kind of have the intention of handing this one down to my daughter. I've actually already let her shoot on it a bit. Um, and the thing is with this, my particular body, the autofocus doesn't work that well anymore. Um, and I think that's my fault. At one point I used one of those swab kits and cleaned the sensor and then the autofocus never worked well after that. So probably I screwed something up. Um, and uh, the, the autofocus of this era, the, the way to get the most out of it is use the center point, like the pinpoint focus, and then you do the focus and recompose workflow. And that's what I always learned. And so to me, that feels natural and fine. Um, my daughter is six years old and that's a bit beyond her capabilities right now. So, um, you know, being able to just like point and shoot in that sense, the autofocus is not very good. If you are okay with the center focus, uh, you know, focus and recompose, then it works quite well for that. And I do actually really still really like that workflow with this camera. That's the way I would use it. This particular lens that I have on there right now is the uh, Canon 24 millimeter F2.8 STM. And I've got like a little lens hood on it. I love putting lens hoods on all my cameras. And then that's probably just a UV filter on it as well. Um, this is definitely my favorite lens for this camera. It works out to be about a 40 millimeter full frame equivalent. Um, really nice little package for just walk around, daily shooting kind of stuff. Good for video also. Um, just a really overall, if you're into prime lenses, like this is the one I recommend for this particular camera body. I think it's just a really nice pairing, these two. Um, the other one that I did enjoy mostly for travel, the um, 55 to 250 uh, millimeter EFS lens is also, I think, one of the best ones out there for, um, for like budget Canon zooms. It's like under $100 now. And it's a great lens. I shot a lot of good stuff on it. Really nice for travel, for having that kind of range to work with where you don't know exactly what you're gonna be shooting. Um, so those two lenses basically are what I traveled with, the 24 mil and then the 55 to 250. Between those two, I covered pretty much every situation. And I've gone through probably 10 different Canon lenses, all more budget lenses. Um, and of all the ones I tried on this camera, those are the two that I've kept you know, to pair with this body. And I think that's kind of all you need. So love this camera, it taught me a lot. I eventually did feel like I outgrew it, um, mostly in doing these types of videos, whereas doing those multi-camera shots, you know, of me playing synths or doing a tutorial about them. I just got to a point where I was a little frustrated with, you know, missing focus with this, autofocus not working. Since it doesn't have a flip out screen, I'd have it overhead and I'd have to use a mirror to be able to see what's on the screen and then try to focus that way. It's kind of hard to do. So um, ultimately I decided I wanted to upgrade this camera. So let's back up a bit. Um, so I did a big year abroad also. Um, I, I lived in Southeast Asia for about a year and that was primarily with this camera and those lenses I mentioned. And uh, while traveling, I met another photographer uh, who had a bunch of her gear with her and she um, just was selling a Canon 50D and that is an earlier model APS-C camera that's kind of a bit more of their like mid-tier range, a bit more professional quality. So I bought that off her for cheap. Um, and I don't remember if I bought a lens or not with it. I think it might've just been body only. 
And what interested me about that one is that that camera can do raw video, which is really cool to play around with. It's like having the full dynamic range of a raw still image, but for video. But man, it's massive files. I mean, it literally, what it shoots is a folder full of raw images, and then you have to use software to stitch them together to turn it into video. Like it doesn't even encode it as video. So it's, it's um, really powerful if you are doing sort of like indie art film kind of stuff where you really want to have a ton of dynamic range to push and pull. It's pretty cool for that. But for doing any more casual video like what I'm doing right now, it's complete overkill. So I played with raw video a bit and very quickly was like, I, I can't handle the complexity of this workflow and the amount of storage I need to, it would, you know, it'd be, I don't remember what it was, but it'd be like 30 gigs for a one minute video or something is ridiculous. Um, and so, uh, kind of stopped using it that way as a stills camera. It was awesome when I wanted something, uh, really rough and tumble. I called that one the tank because I was shooting with it on the side of a volcano on this little dinky tripod. And the thing actually just tumbled down the volcano, like a couple hundred feet, like over rocky soil and stuff. And I, I went down after it, picked it up. It was totally fine. <laughs> so, um, yeah, if you want a really, really robust camera, the Canon 50D uh, is pretty awesome for that. By today's standards, you know, it's not amazing. It's 12 me megapixels and, and I'm sure the autofocus is not amazing. But if you want a camera that you can bludgeon somebody with, um, it's awesome. I ended up giving it away to a friend of mine who travels by motorcycle and he needed like a really rough and tumble camera to document his travels for that. Um, so hopefully he gets some good use out of it. And I gave him some of my lesser used lenses with that one as well. So when I got back um, to the US after my travels, you know, I, I still loved the SL1 and I kind of now got a taste of that more professional quality of the 50D. And so I ended up getting the Canon 80D. And uh, that's one of the ones I'm playing, filming with right now, but I'll go ahead and pull it down just to show you. All right, I'll keep it rolling. Obviously we're not gonna show you this footage, but so this is the Canon 80D. And um, so it's physically much larger, you know, even without a lens attached, it's just a bigger body, much bigger grip. You can see my pinky does actually <laughs> there. I don't, I don't have to roll under the bottom like that. Um, my pinky fits on it. It's a very, uh, very kind of sturdy camera. And at the time um, when I bought this, this was one of the premier cameras for video and I think for specifically for autofocus in video was what this camera was known for is having a really good autofocus system. Coming from the, you know, less than impressive autofocus on the SL1, I thought this, this is gonna be the one for me, right? So um, I did really, um, I think in general, it was way better than what I was working with. By today's standards, the autofocus is not amazing, but it's still decent, still usable. Um, what I found is that, um, the autofocus on this is really designed for tracking faces. And when my face is in the video like this, it's quite good at tracking my face. Even if I like turn away and then turn back, it's usually pretty good at that. But what you might've seen earlier, if I try, you try to hold something up to it like this, you have to actually put the object in front of your face so that it stops tracking your face. And then as soon as you move it out, it's still probably gonna track your face again, not track the object. So for that type of like show and tell type of video, I found this one doesn't work that well. Also, when I have it just focused on my hands and a synthesizer playing, it doesn't know what to focus on. There's no face there in the shot. And so I found that this one, the autofocus really, it's great for faces, not really great for everything else. And um, so through this camera, I started relying a lot more on manual zone focusing. And that's how I do most of my video work actually is with manual zone focusing. Um, especially if I'm gonna be in front of the camera and I can't really monitor the focus during it, zone focusing is the key to that. And there's really nothing wrong with that. That's, that's what the professionals do. Um, you know, it's, it's worth learning. Even if you have a really good autofocus camera, I still think it's worth learning zone focus. The other big limitation of this camera is that uh, it has a recording limit of 30 minutes. That's actually 29.56 or something like that. And so I can see right now on the counter, I'm at 23 minutes. Uh, in a few minutes, this thing's just gonna randomly turn off and you get no warning about it. 
So I frequently, uh, I recorded videos, you know, let's say I get like lost in the sauce playing music, I'm playing for 40 minutes. This thing just stops recording and I don't even notice if I've got headphones on or whatever. So um, that became a problem. I really wanted a camera that could record longer than 30 minutes. Now this one also maxes out at 1080p 60 frames per second, which I think is fine. Um, I don't really do a lot of slow-mo stuff, and so um, I don't use the 60 frames all that much. Most of what I shoot is uh, 30 frames per second, and then sometimes 24. And um, so yeah, the, uh, I, I thought the footage looks really good. When the focus is, is tight, the footage looks really good from this camera, and I'm, I'm pretty happy with it. Low light performance, I think, is pretty good. Um, it's not like, I don't know if this would be like the ideal, you know, concert venue kind of camera. I have shot that type of environment with it and been happy with it. But if I was doing that all day, every day, I'd probably pick something with better low light performance. But in general, uh, for the type of stuff I shoot, this camera has been very solid. Um, I call this one my workhorse camera because it's just very dependable and reliable. I keep the tripod mount on it all the time because the vast majority of the time I use this camera is on a tripod. I don't handhold this one. Um, because the body itself does not have stabilization. The lenses often do, like this particular lens does, but I've never found the Canon built-in lens image stabilization to be very good. It's like, I'm sure it does something, I'm sure it's better than nothing, but it does not, I don't know. It's, um, if I were doing handheld with this camera, I would use a gimbal. Um, that's, I think that's kind of the only way to stabilize these ones. Um, but yeah, so the other thing is, of course, it doesn't shoot 4K. Uh, this was kind of before that was really a big thing. Um, the next generation, the Canon 90D, does shoot 4K. So if you want basically the same camera with 4K, then you want to look at the 90D instead of the 80D. Um, so yeah, this, this camera really has been super solid. I've had very few complaints about it. It's been very dependable and reliable. But that 30-minute recording limit caught me a lot of times. Um, and that was pretty frustrating and I wanted to find something that wasn't limited to that. Um, and the other thing is just this general size and weight. Like this is one, I have carried this while traveling and it's just too big and heavy. Even if I put the small prime lens on it, you know, certainly that helps, but I just, I prefer a smaller camera when I'm walking around traveling. Now, the other thing that makes this one special for me is I don't know if you can see this lens I have on here. Let's see if it'll focus on that, huh? Ooh, look at that autofocus. See, that autofocus is working. This is the 17 to 55 EFS lens by Canon. And this is, um, I call it the end game lens for EFS, for their, their APS-C crop sensor uh, cameras, because what this lens gives you a uh, constant F2.8 aperture throughout the entire range. You know, that 17 to 55 is basically the same as the 1855 kit lens. You might think, well, isn't that just like a kit lens? No, it's way better. This is more like the, um, what they call the bag of primes type of lens because you get that F2.8 very narrow depth of field at every single uh, you know, focal length that you might want to use here. And it's just like the, from what I've read, I've never really used Canon L glass, so I can't comment on it, but it's, it's you know, supposed to be the best. Um, from what I've read, this EFS 17 to 55 is the same optics as what's in L glass. So the same glass inside, it's just in a plastic housing instead of metal and it's not weather sealed, whereas the L glass is all weather sealed. So it's, um, it's not going to like stand up to the rigors of the L series glass, but also it costs so much less. When I got this lens, I ended up trading three other lenses to get this one with a rough, I think it was around $750 US equivalent value is what I ended up trading for this one. And um, I have zero regrets about that. Uh, even though one of the lenses I traded was my 40 mil prime, which was one of my favorites. Um, and then the two other ones I didn't care that much about. Um, it was well worth the trade for that. And I've never looked back. And basically as soon as I got this lens and I put it on this camera, I've not taken it off. This combo here, the 17 to 55 EFS and the ADD, like this is quality. And um, I, I think this has significantly improved the quality of the videos I've been able to make with this. Um, so I, I really have no significant complaints with this and I've been very, very happy with it. Um, so 
this kind of became my, my A cam, my primary cam. Like, see, this thing's about to run out. So I'm just gonna go ahead and do a cut here and we'll get everything set up again. Okay, so now I've got both recording again. Um, the only other thing I'll mention with the Canon ADD, as well as the earlier SL1, is uh, they both will split your files every four gigs. So if you do a long recording, you're gonna have a bunch of files that you stitch together later. Not a huge deal at all, a ton of cameras do that, but it is certainly nice in more modern cameras that don't do that. They just give you one big long file for the whole recording. It's just easier to manage. So that's a, a minor, little minor nitpick, but anywho. So I got the Canon ADD, that 17 to 55 EFS lens. It's like, this is it, this is my A cam setup. Um, so then I got to the point where I wanted to improve on my B cam setup. And um, you know, like I said, I was using this for overhead shots. I tended to use the ADD for the more kind of like, I call like the, the glamor shots or like the beauty angle where it's kind of at a nice, you know, nice angle. Watch a lot of my older videos. Most of the shots that look really good are on that Canon ADD. So I wanted something that would be, you know, small, lightweight, something that could easily be an overhead camera lens, as well as something that I would travel with. So this is what I ended up getting. This is the Panasonic GX85 with the 14 to 140 millimeter OIS 2 lens. The 2 means it's the second generation of this, which is weather sealed. The 1, the earlier generation, is not weather sealed. And um, also note that there's a very much earlier version, the 14 to 140 mega OIS. That's really a different lens. It's optically not as good. Um, so this one, the 14 to 140 Power OIS 2, or the Power OIS 1, whether or not you want weather sealing, um, very, very good lenses, what they call a super zoom, because it covers a massive range. So in terms of full frame equivalents, that's 28 to 280 millimeters. Um, just, it's just basically every other lens fits into that, somewhere in that range. Um, now, of course, it is variable aperture. You're not getting constant aperture. Um, but really, this is the ideal travel lens. So when you go out traveling, you don't know exactly what you're going to run into. You know, one minute I want to shoot an entire building. Another minute I want to zoom in on a pigeon on the gargoyle on the top of that building. This is the kind of lens that will let you give you that type of uh, range, you know, where you can be super wide to super telephoto and everything in between. Um, this is also a great camera lens set up for um, for like hiking, uh, anything where, you know, a lot of times we'd be like traveling, like, oh, we're going to go on this hike and there's a waterfall at the end and I want to be able to shoot the parrots flying around as we walk there and stuff like that. This is the ideal setup for that. Really, really nice for these kinds of travel situations where you just don't quite know what you're going to get into. You want something versatile. So uh, the weak point is going to be low light because it doesn't have a super wide aperture. The max is f3.5 and you get that f3.5 I think only at the 14 millimeter end. Um, whereas like as soon as you start zooming um, then you know you lose that. So it's definitely not amazing for low light. That said because it has image stabilization and the dual IS system where both the body and the lens have separate individual in image stabilization that talk to each other and they like work in tandem. That's what Panasonic calls dual IS. It's really, really, really good. And that actually does allow you to use it at night and in low light situations handheld uh, where a lot of other cameras simply wouldn't work. Like you might be able to get a correct exposure with another camera, but it's gonna be so shaky and unusable that, you know, it's like, what's the point of even using it? Whereas with this one, like I have literally stood on a beach at night, taken a photo of the moon, handheld at full telephoto extension and gotten a better, like more crisp result than I've gotten using a bigger camera, bigger sensor, like the ADD with its APS-C sensor with the telephoto on a tripod. Like I can get better night shots handheld with this than I can with the others on a tripod, which is amazing. So basically what it means is that this camera is almost as good as a gimbal, just built in. And you do have to spend time with it and practice and kind of learn how to move your body smoothly and stuff like that. But you know, if you're into getting handheld footage, this really opens up a lot of possibilities with that. And you don't have to carry a gimbal, you don't have to carry a tripod. And so for me, that's been really huge because when I mentioned I was 
you know, living overseas for a year, that entire time I was carrying three tripods with me, one full size Manfrotto tripod and then two smaller ones, a gorilla pod and then this other small little like folding one. And, um, and I used them, I used all three frequently. Often I'd have um, one camera on one, another one holding a light and a third one holding my audio recorder, something like that. So I really did need a lot of tripods. Um, but with this camera, I travel with just a tiny little like tabletop tripod. Like if I wanted to shoot a long time lapse or something, I would use it for that. But I don't carry a big tripod anymore. I don't need to with this one. And that makes it so much lighter weight. Um, so I really am very happy with this. Now, in terms of the videos that I do, you know, I started using this as my overhead. Um, I also got the Panasonic 14 millimeter f 2.5 lens, little pancake lens with this, which I believe is the absolute smallest M43 native lens you can get. And it's, it's really lovely with this one. I don't have it with me right now cause it's on my daughter's camera and she's traveling, but, um, yeah, so I really, I have enjoyed that lens. I haven't enjoyed it as much as I thought I would. I was thinking like, this is going to be my street photography lens and maybe my video lens if I don't like this one for video. As it turns out, this one works just fine for video. And so I mostly use this just for the convenience of being able to zoom. Um, but, and then I, I didn't end up doing a whole ton of street photography with that little pancake because, um, basically because the, the zoom ring on it is so small and it's kind of hard to, to manually, uh, or sorry, not zoom, the focus ring. Because the focus ring on it is so small, it's kind of hard to manually use. And I do tend to like to do manual focusing um, while, when I'm doing street photography. Um, I think the autofocus is fine. It's just not how I tend to shoot. So I didn't find myself using that one all that much. And, um, but still, I was pretty happy with the Canon ADD now being my primary camera, the Panasonic GX85 being my secondary or B cam, mostly for overhead shots or like some sort of like zoomed in detail. A lot of the shots you've seen where it's like really highly zoomed in on just my fingers or just some knobs on a synth or something, it's probably from this camera. So um, I've been really happy with this one. Now for most of that period, um, I was working from home. And then of course, with all the COVID restrictions, um, I wasn't traveling very much either. And so I, that's really where I kind of got into music and synthesizers is like, I needed a hobby I could do at home. And I needed a way of, you know, using all this equipment, my photo video equipment at home and you know, recording myself performing on synths and tutorials and stuff was the way that I, I got through those years. I tried other forms of studio photography and I just, I found it really boring. I never really got into it. So, um, doing this kind of video of myself, um, seemed to work fine. So that's kind of where I was for a couple of years. Now, um, fast forward and we, my family moved, uh, from Oregon where we lived previously to Asheville, North Carolina, where we live now. And along with that, um, I ended up switching jobs and kind of switching careers actually. Um, and so I now, as of this year, have a job where I commute downtown every day. And, um, that has really reinvigorated my interest in street photography. And because I'm so, you know, new to the area, like not only new to Asheville, but new to the Eastern U S in general, there's a lot in this area that just feels different to me. There's cultural differences, architectural differences, things like that. So it feels like I'm traveling in my own city. And that's, um, that's what really inspires me to shoot still photography. And this camera is a great pairing for that. Um, now, like I said, this particular lens is great for when you're traveling somewhere where you may never go there again. You know, you get one chance to get these shots and that's it. This is still the lens I will choose for that type of situation because um, it's just so versatile in its range. But in the city you live in, you have ample time to go back, you know, go back to the same spot, shoot it again, shoot it in different lighting conditions, different time of year. So for that kind of scenario, I wouldn't use this lens. Um, so let me show you what I got into next. Okay. So this is the same camera, uh, GX85, but I've now put on a vintage lens. Um, so back in December, 2023, I was kind of going through my collection of film cameras. Um, I have 
quite a lot of film cameras over the years that I've amassed. Um, a lot of them I got for free. Uh, it would be, you know, people giving away boxes of old photo equipment. They don't know what it does or what it is or whatever. And, um, or, you know, some, some photographer who's, uh, you know, decided they've moved on from this gear or what it, for whatever reason, they're giving it away. So I amassed a whole bunch of film cameras, most of which were like these old Polaroids and things that they don't make film for anymore. So they're, they're basically just decoration. You can't do much with them. Um, but anything that shoots 35 millimeter roll film, uh, you can still use today. You can still buy that film and shoot it. And so I, in that collection, one of those cameras was this one. This is the Pentax Spotmatic. And I'll go ahead and throw this lens on it so it looks right. So this is the Pentax Spotmatic SP, and it is with one of the original lenses uh, that came at that time. This is the Super Tacomar 50mm f1.4. This is a thoriated lens, which means that there is radioactive material in the glass itself. And I don't know if you'll be able to see on here, but it has this very kind of orangey golden kind of tint to the glass. That's from the thorium in it. And um, basically what that means is it, it gives sort of a color cast to the image. Um, it's similar to using like a, an orange filter or a yellow filter on top of your camera where it's going to be removing a lot of the blue frequencies from your image. So the whole thing is going to feel warmer. Similar to um, yeah, using a filter or even post-processing, you just pulled your blues back a lot. Um, you're going to get this kind of warm golden type of image. And to me, it feels a lot like shooting at golden hour all the time. And I really, really like that effect. You can treat these lenses with UV light to cancel out that effect, to de-yellow them and turn them back into kind of a neutral clear. But I would never do that with mine. I really love the effect. Um, and I think it's worth shooting through. So uh, as I was going through my old film lenses, um, I have, this one is kind of one of the best lenses ever made. At the time, I didn't know that. I'd been sitting on these for years just as like decoration on a shelf. I, and I had uh, two other lenses also that came with this camera, which was the Super Tacomar 28mm f3.5, as well as the Super Tacomar 150mm f4.0. And so I had this, this camera and this set, this trio of lenses, and I, um, I had just never tried to shoot on it. Um, the, when I, did shoot film a little bit. I dabbled in it. It wasn't much, but anytime I did shoot film, I shot on this camera. This is the Pentax K1000. And this is the quintessential like student camera, <laughs> basically, because a lot of schools around the world would uh, purchase these cameras in bulk and use them for their photography classes or like journalism classes, yearbook, that kind of thing. So a lot of students got exposed to this particular camera in, uh, you know, in high school. And um, this particular lens that's on it, the 50 millimeter f2.0 is probably the one that they used. This is the kit lens that came on it. And it's very, um, very reliable, very robust, like almost bulletproof camera, fully mechanical. And uh, so this one, it, it just works. It works really well. So this is the one that I always uh, shot film on when I was experimenting with film, but I didn't do a whole lot of it. And um, I never got that deep into this particular camera. It was just kind of like I used it because it was given to me um, and, and it works and it's reliable. And so because I had that one and that's a later generation, you know, when I looked at the Spotmatic, I was like, well, that's an earlier camera. It's not gonna be as good. I've already got the K1000, why would I bother? Well, that was a mistake because this is a really, really amazing camera. I would say it's even better than the K1000. It's actually more of a, kind of a premium one, so it has some features that the K1000 doesn't. With the K1000, they strip things back to make it simpler, whereas this one has a bit of extra features. Not that I need those features, but still, it's really um, also very reliable, very beautiful camera, I think. This is kind of the quintessential SLR design that I really love, the, um, that pentaprism kind of bump on top. This uh, this line of cameras, the Spotmatic, is what introduced that that type of visual camera look to the world and obviously everybody's copied it since because it's beautiful and um, the other thing I didn't realize is that these lenses this is called m42 mount which is just a screw mount 
Um, this is before kind of the bayonet mounts uh, became really popular. And this type of lens is extremely simple to adapt to a modern mirrorless camera because the, you can see the sizes are similar, but more importantly, the flange distance, which is the distance between the back of the lens and the film plane or the sensor plane in a digital camera, um, is actually much smaller on these cameras. So you can add an adapter, you can see that right there, just add a bit of kind of thickness, it's a spacer effectively, that allows these lenses to focus on a modern camera. So I realized that for years, I had been sitting on this completely premium uh, collection of lenses, not using them because I didn't realize how simple they were to adapt to mirrorless cameras. The first adapter I bought was literally $11. Uh, so for $11, you can take one of these old lenses, put it on a modern camera, and it will work beautifully. Um, and the other feature of these, these modern mirrorless cameras that make that really important is focus peaking. Um, focus peaking allows you to use a manual focus lens and nail the focus, like get it just spot on. And if you come from only using autofocus, that's you know a pretty intimidating thing to do with manual focus lenses. They will often um, just be difficult, you know, to uh, to focus um, just looking through an optical viewfinder. Especially, you're just never quite sure if you're getting it, and it's a lot of kind of just shoot and pray. Well, with focus peaking on an electronic viewfinder or through the rear screen, um, you all all that guesswork kind of goes away. So focus peaking helps you pick your focus point, of course, but it also helps you pick your aperture because um, you can see how deep your focus plane is going to be when you're looking through, uh, through the EVF or through on the rear screen. And that has been absolutely huge for me. Um, so this kind of combo of uh, you know, a relatively modern mirrorless camera, the GX85, um, and a vintage lens from the 1960s or early 1970s that's fully mechanical, beautiful focus, uh, beautiful aperture. Um, this, this is what's really reinvigorated still photography for me. A sleek little digital mirrorless body with a vintage lens that imparts a lot of character into your image is really a pleasure to use. Just absolutely smooth focusing, smooth aperture. I really like that having full manual control over both of those things means that the camera cannot change them. Um, in a lot of the shoots I've done, like I thought I was in manual focus, but I was accidentally in autofocus, and then the camera just completely, you know, messes it up. Um, or maybe, you know, I, I wanted a really wide open aperture, but then the camera stepped in in some auto mode and like stepped it, you know, stepped down for me. That kind of thing. It's just nice to know that I don't have to worry about what mode the camera is in there is no physical way for the camera to control those things. So I know it's always gonna be exactly the way I said it. I really appreciate that about these uh, manual lenses. It's really helped me to feel more confident that the way I set up the camera is the way it's gonna come out at the end. Um, and, you know, of course, any camera you can put into a full manual mode and have manual control over those things. But oftentimes when I would do that, I would still screw something up you know, I would leave auto ISO on by accident or whatever. There's various things in which you can just kind of make a mistake. Whereas with this, it's absolute surety that the camera will not change the focus or the aperture. The only things it has control over are, are ISO and shutter speed. So I found that to be really, really helpful for getting good consistent results, um, especially for video projects, but for my still photography as well. Around about seven months ago, December 2023, I realized that for the low, low cost of $11, I could adapt these lovely vintage lenses onto my modern camera. And that is what brought me back into the place of carrying a camera every day. Because there was a period, uh, you know, like I said, when I was shooting on this one, it was about seven years that I carried this every single day. And um, then I kind of took a long hiatus from still photography had to do with, you know, settling down, starting a family, having a young child, um, a lot more, a lot busier with work, a lot of work stress, and also just not being able to travel or go outside as much. I just wasn't motivated to carry a camera as much anymore. Um, and that changed when I now have this lovely combination. I have a job where I'm commuting downtown every day. So every morning, 
uh, I shoot while I walk from where I park to where I work. It's about a 10 minute walk. And uh, so I shoot during that time. I also try to go out every day on my lunch break and shoot a bit, at least for 10, 15, 20 minutes, just walk around and shoot. And then also on the walk from the office back to the car again, um, I'll shoot there as well. And sometimes I'll take these long meandering paths. So, you know, that 10 minute walk is 20 minutes because I'm going some inefficient path just to see different things. And so that has really reinvigorated my, um, my you know, kind of city, uh, city street style photography. And I'm really enjoying that. And as I worked more with these vintage lenses, both for stills and video, I've really come to just absolutely fall in love with them. Um, they have so much beautiful character. They're such a joy to use. They, f they fit really nicely. You can see it's, it's a good size. And this particular body, the GX85, you can see it's like, I'll hold up the Spotmatic again here. You know, it really is kind of similar in size and shape and feel to a film camera. Um, you know, it's not quite the same. Um, this one still feels a little better in the hands and it is actually a bit heavier, you know, than a film camera, but um, it's, it's just a really nice experience. So I've, I've come to really enjoy this as you know, my new everyday carry. And in terms of still photography, I think it's roughly the same as the SL1 that I carried before. This one's 16 megapixels, this one's 18 megapixels. It's, I mean, it's about the same. Um, I see very little difference. I think in terms of the, the quality of the glass, I definitely see a difference. But in terms of the quality of the sensor, I think they're about the same, they're fine. Um, in terms of video though, this one easily outperforms the SL1. And I think it actually outperforms the ADD as well. Um, not just because it can shoot 4K, even if I'm just comparing 1080p footage with 1080p, I think this just looks better. Um, a lot of it has to do with me using these lenses on it, but I've tried the ADD with these same vintage lenses and it's not the same. Um, so yeah, I, I really think that in terms of video, this one, uh, this, the combo has uh, helped me get better results, things that I'm really happy with just the footage straight out of camera. I should also mention on all these cameras, I try to shoot on a fairly flat profile. So on the Canon cameras, I use their uh, neutral profile. And then on the, the Panasonic, I use the natural profile. They're both similar in that it's, it's, not, like, it's not like log footage, it's not totally flat, but um, it's fairly flat, uh, a little bit desaturated. So it's a good starting point if you're into color grading. Um, or if you're into post-processing your still photography. Um, so I really like both those profiles, but it's also, it's got enough color and depth that if you had to use the footage straight out of camera, you could. And with these lenses, I sometimes do. Um, like even for still photography, I will sometimes just use the JPEG straight out of the camera because it looks so good. You know, compared to the, the modern lens here, the 14 to 140, um, I don't think there's a single photo I took with this that I was like really happy with straight out of camera. It needed a bit of you know, post-processing and same with my Canons. I always would do some post-processing on those. So it really is a different, a different kind of feel and workflow when you can, um, uh, feel really happy with what you're getting straight out of camera and just use the JPEGs as is, you know, there's still some that I choose to edit, but I feel like I don't have to with this as much. There's different sorts of film emulation profiles in it. So L monochrome is this really high contrast black and white. And um, here, I'll just show you a little example of that because I think it's one of my favorites. You can use these profiles for, for video. So like here, I'll show you yourself here. All right, so that's that L monochrome, high contrast, black and white, the deep, deep blacks. I really love this, um, this one, and I will frequently use this one straight out of camera. The natural one, I think, also often looks good if you kind of like that more, just kind of slightly desaturated film look. I think it's, it's awesome for that. Um, there's a few others. The Vivid one um, is a bit like Velvia, um, where it's like really hyper-saturated. I don't use it much, but sometimes it can be fun. Um, yeah, th those are most of the ones I use. And then there's also custom. You can create your own profile if you want to tweak it more, which is cool. But mostly I'm shooting in natural for color or L monochrome for black and white. And um, I love that you kind of have the option for video to like bake that straight in. It's like applying a LUT in the camera, basically. Um, 
And then also for still photography, if you shoot in the RAW plus JPEG, the RAW will still be full RAW and the JPEG will have the baked in LUT. Um, and I think that's really awesome. A lot of times, like for black and white especially, like I love that when I set this one in, you know, kind of it's black and white mode, everything I'm seeing when I'm shooting is black and white. I'm looking through the viewfinder and I'm seeing the world in black and white with that deep contrast. Uh, but if I shoot something and then later on in, you know, when I'm going through my photos, I decide, you know, actually, I, I wish I'd shot that one in color instead. Well, it still is color in the raw. I can take the raw file and edit it however I want, including applying the other color profiles in here. So it's really, really flexible. On the Canon cameras, the profiles are like, fine they're not they're nothing special at all i basically just keep it on that neutral profile all the time and do all my color work in post or black and white work in post um so like shooting raw plus jpeg on the canon bodies feels kind of pointless because i'm just going to throw away all the jpegs anyway whereas on this one it's actually very worthwhile um because the e even if if i do end up wanting to uh, kind of customize the way i edit something i will um i will still stick with uh, I, I still use that JPEG as a reference image of like, I really like the way the JPEG came out of the camera. Maybe I can make it even better by editing the raw, but I can go back and forth and look at the JPEG and be like, am I close to what the camera did? You know, am I better, am I worse, whatever. So I really enjoy the raw plus JPEG on this is very worthwhile. So as I got more into this, um, I got more into these lenses. You know, I already had three of them and I started looking up kind of the history of them and, um, the history of the Spotmatic and the Pentax uh, Asahi optical cameras in general. It's all really fascinating history. And I just basically decided I, I gotta, I gotta catch them all. Um, I gotta start collecting these lenses. And so I now have almost an entire set of primes of these, uh, these Takamar lenses. Specifically what I go for is the Super Takamar. There's different series of them. I'm not gonna go super deep into all the minutia of the Takamar lenses right here. Cause I, I think I'm going to make a whole separate video just about them. But um, basically the, the Cliff's notes on it is that Super Takamar is less coating, so you're going to have more flare. Super Multicoated, or SMC, uh, Takamar is more coatings, so more control of the flare. I personally really like the way these lenses flare, and so I've been kind of opting for the Super Takamar versions because I want to work with that flare. But if you don't want the flare or you want to control it better than the SMC or super multi-coated versions are better for that. And I do have one of those as well. But uh, in general, I've got basically a full range now between 28 millimeters and 200 millimeters. I've got almost every single prime in between those, which is awesome. <laughs> and uh, I've also started getting some of these lens hoods for them. Um, and the other thing I just started with this week was I got this uh, focal reducer, which allows me it's, uh, to basically zoom out more on one of these lenses um, because with an M43 body, it's 2x crop factor. So every lens, like this 50 millimeter lens, is going to render like 100 millimeters when I'm using it because I'm cropping in, uh, you know, 50% on, uh, on this smaller sensor. So with the focal reducer, it backs that up a bit again. So the math gets kind of complicated. For this particular one, it's easy. 50 millimeters times 0.7 equals 35 millimeters. Then 35 millimeters doubled is 70 millimeters. So basically when I use this 50 mil with the 0.7 focal reducer on an M43 body, it's roughly the same as a 70 millimeter lens. Um, so you have to kind of do that math on every single one. But what the focal reducer lets you do is basically get two different focal lengths out of every single lens. So it's almost like doubling the, you know, the size of your collection, which is awesome. And my widest one, the 28, it allows me to go even wider to roughly 20 millimeters. So this has been really helpful. I just started playing with it this week, um, so I'm still pretty inexperienced with it. I have noticed it does make the image a bit soft around the edges, but for what I shoot, I think that's totally fine. Um, and the uh, the premium version, the Metabones, costs more than this camera and lens combined, so I don't think I'm going for that. Um, anyway, I've, I've really found this to be kind of like the gem uh, setup for me. And with a lot of what I do with both with photography and video, as well as with my music, uh, with synthesizers and sequencers and stuff, uh, you know, you may have noticed it's kind of my thing that I, I, I want to find like the diamond in the rough setup, you know, this synth paired with this sequencer or this camera paired with this lens, like 
this is the setup that allows me to do something or allows me to, you know, execute some idea. Um, I really, really enjoy that. And I kind of have this, this idea it may not be true, but it's kind of like this idea of soulmates that like for every camera, there's a lens that's just its soulmate for every synth, you know, there's an effects pedal that it's, that's its soulmate or whatever. Like there's just kind of these perfect pairings out there. Um, and I love the search for them and trying different things. And, you know, I can say with these lenses in getting this whole range of primes, I thought I would very easily find a favorite and I haven't, uh, the ones that don't seem that great on paper are fantastic in practice. So it's honestly hard to choose. They're all really good. But, um, in general, one of the wider primes on M43 on a small body like this is just really, really nice for kind of walk around shooting and for video. Um, now, of course, these lenses are not stabilized, you know, well before stabilization existed. Um, but the, the IBIS in the body is good enough um, that it still helps significantly. So I still feel like I can do handheld video with these and get really, really good results. I will, with a longer lens, especially like a you know, 105 and longer, I will definitely use stabilization software in post, um, you know, to help it a little bit more, just to get rid of some of the kind of micro jitters you get with the long lens. Um, and of course on a tripod, it would be fine too. But, um, but for these wider ones, just handheld, I'm finding I really, really like the, uh, the stabilized image that I'm getting out of it straight out of camera. So I'm very happy with this. So I feel like this is the type of setup where, you know, just similar to my SL1 where it kept me happy for like seven years. I think this can keep me happy for another seven years. Um, but this is good enough and cheap enough that it got me thinking, well, do I still need these Canon cameras anymore? You know, doing stuff like this, shooting multiple cameras with multiple angles, um, having a matched set is going to make it easier to work with in post. Um, especially with, you know, I like to do this kinds of heavy color grades on my um, on my videos just for artistic flair. Um, and having, you know, two fairly matched, you know, neutral exposures to start, uh, so you can apply the same grade to both is really nice. And so got me thinking as dependable and reliable as my Canon ADD has been, maybe, uh, I don't need any more. Maybe what I should get is two GX 85s. Well, I started, uh, looking into that idea the the GX85 was just discontinued this year 2024 so it was it was launched in 2017 discontinued 2024 which is a very long run for a digital camera um, and it even outlasted what was supposed to be the upgrade <laughs> that came after this one um, that was produced for a shorter period of time so um, so basically you can't buy one of these new anymore you know you can buy it used or you might find it new old stock but you can't buy it new from Panasonic um, but so I started looking at some other similar things and I found the Panasonic G85 and that is what, um, you've been watching me through, uh, this whole time. So, uh, this is the Panasonic G85 I'm filming with filming myself and I have it side by side with my ADD so that I can compare this footage in post and see how they look. Um, I purposely chose sort of a challenging environment. You see, there's this very bright window behind me. Um, you know, which, which would kind of blow out a lot of the highlights, um, back there. I do have some overhead lighting, but that's it. There's no video lights running. There's no, no key light, no fill light, nothing. It's just overhead can lights, this window light behind me. There's another window there. That's it. I kind of wanted to see how both these cameras would compare in this, you know, non-ideal kind of lighting situation. And, um, so yeah, I'll cut them back and forth a couple of times. You can decide for yourself, but I think that, um, in general, what I'm seeing so far with the G85, which is basically the same camera as this, just in more of an SLR kind of style. Uh, so it's got the bump on top. It's a little bit bigger. The viewfinder is centered on the back. Uh, the screen flips out. So this one has this tilt screen, so it'll go all the way perpendicular like that, or you can also tilt it this way up above this. Um, I find for still photography out and about, I love this. Cause this is like using a waist level viewfinder. You look down and you shoot for video. Also, I find I'm really stable. If I have this down near my waist and I'm shooting, I really love this, this tilt out screen. Um, but if I'm going to be in front of the camera, like I am right now, well, that screen doesn't help me at all. So the flip out screen you need, if 
you're working primarily on a tripod. And so um, the G85 has the flip out screen. I don't like it nearly as much for photography, but for video, it's amazing. And it's the exact same image quality I get in this. So I know I'm gonna have like a match set in terms of sensors and the color profile that it's applying. And um, I can use all the same lenses on it too. So what I'm filming with right now is the, the lens that it came with. It's the 12 to 60 kit lens, variable aperture. Um, it's, uh, it's fine. There's nothing, I haven't found anything strictly to complain about with this lens yet. Um, it's known for being very sharp, um, you know, which is always good. Um, but its aperture range is really not very ideal. And uh, I think pretty much the only time I'm going to use this lens is when I want autofocus. And that's one of the things I'm testing in this video right now is I'm allowing both the ADD and the G85 to use autofocus throughout to see how that works. And um, so far, what I can see in the little screen seems fine. So, so yeah, this will be just kind of a general autofocus lens, but most of the time I'm going to be using these uh, vintage manual lenses using manual zone focusing and focus peaking to get that right. And um, yeah, and I'm, I'm really so far enjoying the G85. It's, it has a bigger grip. Um, it's kind of halfway in between the ADD and this one. Like this grip is so small, I had to actually add a third party one to it. You see it screws onto the bottom. And even still, it's pretty darn small. Like if I shoot on this long hours, my hand definitely feels a little tired. Um, also, if I'm using a really long telephoto lens on it, it just doesn't balance that much. I end up carrying the camera completely by the lens and just bringing this hand up once in a while. Um, but uh, I have found because the the grip on this is so small. I found other ways of using it. Like one of the ways I actually hold the camera a lot is like this, put it here, put my palm against the screen and I'll use the shutter button with my thumb. And this allows me to get these kinds of shots like from different angles that I just wouldn't normally do. It is shooting from the hip. So I'm kind of blind when I'm shooting that way, but with zone focusing, knowing the camera is not going to change my focal uh, depth and, you know, being able to just see the aperture right there. I've been able to get some pretty cool shots uh, working this way. I wouldn't do this for video, of course, but for still frames, um, you know, for these kind of interesting angles. Oh, that camera just turned off. Okay, so the ADD battery just died, um, and I'm going to be working purely off the G85 here now. So yeah, I found the compact size of this has allowed me to kind of get some different grips on it or different ways of holding it to get some different results. And I, I really, really like this as a handheld camera. The G85 also feels very good in the hand. It has a much bigger grip definitely handles a longer, heavier lens much better. Um, and it has, it reminds me of the ADD and that it just kind of feels more professional. Like if I was doing a paid gig, like I used to do little side gigs of like event photography and videography and stuff like that. So for that kind of context, uh, where I know I'm gonna be shooting straight for like four hours, I would rather have the G85 because it just has the bigger grip, it feels better, it's gonna handle a heavier lens better. Um, you know, that's, that's going to work out. And then for what I'm doing right now, these kinds of tripod shots with video, I've got a, a lav mic plugged into it. You know, this does not have a mic input at all. And so the G85 does, that's a huge difference. Now, of course I could always record the audio to some separate device. So for me, that's not really a big deal, but it is convenient to just record straight into the camera. Um, and we'll see how this works. I haven't listened to these preamps much, so hopefully it's decent. So, um, I feel like as, as sort of a drop in replacement for my ADD, that's where I'm evaluating this G85 to see, is it gonna handle all the same situations? And um, so far so good, but you know, still early days with it. I've decided that I'm gonna keep them both for a period of at least six months and try to use them both kind of interchangeably, cut the video together and see how I feel about it at the end of that time. And I may end up just keeping them, keeping them all, um, but I may also end up selling the Canon, uh, the ADD and that lovely 17 to 55 EFS lens as, you know, as a bundle, um, if I'm happy enough with the G85. So we'll see how that goes. Final thing I'll mention here, as I've been out, out and about shooting with this type of setup, um, there was another photographer who saw me out, uh, shooting, flagged me down. We just talked about photography and, uh, for, for a while. He is a retired career photographer. He um, initially shot for the army and then uh, later worked as a, a journalist for newspapers and magazines. And um, he ended up gifting me his entire Nikon set. 
So I now also have this. This is the Nikon F, uh, which is an absolutely legendary camera. Um, basically, pretty much every world event that happened in the 1960s was documented with this camera. Um, talking about like going to the moon, Olympics, uh, you know, protests and wars, like everything. This was like the photojournalist camera throughout the, the 1960s, uh, some of the 70s. And this thing is an absolute workhorse beast. Uh, he gave me not only the camera, but also his five lenses with it. So all of these are Nikon F-mount lenses, um, AI lenses, so before AIS. And um, they have been fantastic. And so I've also been using these Nikon lenses on my digital bodies as well. I'm gonna do a separate video purely about this camera and the Nikon lenses. Um, so that will come up at some point. But definitely that has been another point where I've really been kind of diving into all of these vintage lenses and their different characteristics and what they can do and why I might use one over another um, and really enjoying that. And I feel like it's reinvigorated a lot of my, especially my still photography, um, but it's, it's bleeding into my video work as well. So I just kind of wanted to, to share a lot of those thoughts here. I've got, um, I want to do some more deep dive kind of stuff on this, uh, this vintage film era uh, lenses and, and gear um, and just kind of hopefully demonstrate more about like what you can do with this. Cause like what's really amazing with these things is that, you know, this, this camera, I know it's gone up in price now because it's discontinued, but when I bought it, um, I think I paid about $350 for the camera body. And then this lens, if you just bought it on eBay right now, it's going to be like a hundred bucks. And a lot of the other Takamar lenses are like 50 bucks. And then the adapter or the focal reducer is maybe another 20 to a hundred bucks, depending on what you get. Like overall, we're talking about 500 ish, 600 ish dollars in today's market for this kind of setup. And like, I don't, I don't know what else you need. Like, this is so good. The quality of the image you get from this is so good. I can see certain circumstances, like if you're a sports photographer, a wildlife photographer, if you're shooting, you know, clubs and performances with extremely low light, there's certain situations where this, these cameras not gonna, not gonna like stand up against, you know, other more expensive things. But for 500 ish dollars, uh, I feel like this outperforms a lot of the $2,000 cameras out there. Um, it's really, really incredible uh, what these things can do. Unlimited 4K recording. Um, you know, you can use a dummy battery. It's the way I'm powering the G85 right now is with a USB power bank with a dummy battery going into it. Um, literally unlimited 4K recording. The only limit is the size of my SD card that's in there. And, you know, even that I could have it writing out to an external SSD, I think. I've never tried that, but um, yeah, it's it's pretty incredible if you're into uh, either still photography or video. Um, these Panasonic Lumix M43 cameras are choice. Really, really nice. So um, hopefully that was entertaining uh, for some of you out there. Um, just kind of wanted to give this general heads up that like, hey, I'm going to be posting more photography and videography kind of stuff. Uh, not purely music, but in my mind, they're all related. They're all intertwined. You know, I do the, I, this is all related to the art that I want to put out in the world. So, um, that's all my thoughts on it for today. I think I've talked plenty. Um, see you in the next one. Cheers.